Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I'm your host, Benedict Tyne, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. How are you, Malcolm? Hey, Benny. I'm great, man. How are you? Great. Thank you. Fantastic. So, we're not going to lie. Both of us are tired, but we're just going to pretend as if things are good. <laughs> <laughs> but things are good. I'm, no, they're good. Yeah. Definitely good. And and for me, it's just early, so I'm just like just waking up tired, but it's uh, it's normal tired. My By the time I finish this cup of coffee... People will hear me being reborn as this episode goes on. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to it. No, I think the energy is great. All good. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, we are going to talk totally... about uh, vocal, choosing the right vocal mic for your voice and for your environment slash room. That is our topic. But in musical news and banter, I am going to jam with some friends tonight. It's probably my first time jamming with somebody in like two years. How crazy oh, wow. is that? Like oh, wow, other than awesome. like a random like there happens to be a guitar in the room and play for thirty seconds with somebody, this is like actually like what's going to be you know drums, little PA system, and we're having to jam, and that's the purpose. And I'm pretty excited. It's going to be weird. <laughs> wow, awesome! So, but it's like a, a real jam, so there's nothing like um, prepared, or is it? Um, yeah, like nothing a, prepared. It's it's okay. two old bandmates of mine here. I'm going to expose expose myself and be vulnerable here. Um, I was in a band called Sound and Science in high school. And that music does exist online for those people that want to go digging. It was like, I think I've talked about it. It was like technical Coldplay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, I, 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 I don't even have to say that because the... The 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 only ep- the like stuff we the only stuff we recorded wasn't wasn't that technical, but by the end it was like full on prog. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, so getting back, the, like some of those guys have just stayed some of my best friends through my through my life. So mm-hmm. uh, gonna go meet up with them and jam away through the night. It'll be super fun, just for awesome. fun. That that's so cool. Yeah, um, I don't know about you, Malcolm. That that's just I have just one one thought here, and that is, do you still feel like making music yourself like when you're working on music of other people all the time because i've i've definitely struggled with that i'm just getting back into like enjoying making my own music like with my band and everything and i'm not contributing much to the writing except for a couple of backing vocals but i start to enjoy the practicing again and looking forward Uh. to the band practices and looking forward to playing live and all that and that hasn't been the case the last couple of years just because my creative sort of energy and bandwidth and all that was already spent each night, basically. Right, right. It, it has been, I don't know, it's hard to answer that because I don't think I know yet, but I found that with all of the television work I'm doing, for, for listeners who aren't aware, I, I do a lot of um, like reality and documentary sound on set for, for t- TV. And for that stuff, like that's taken me away from music, where opposed, like uh, before that, I would spend every waking hour in, in the room I'm in right now just mixing and mastering music and, and before that producing it and engineering it. So all of a sudden I've had this like increased distance from from music and I, I went like a month without working on music, right? Where I, I came home and started mixing again. But in that month I found myself like listening to music and just having like a totally different emotional reaction to it um, and like and getting so into it. And uh, so I'm like falling back in love with music. Mm-hmm. But as to your question, like, do I have like the the urge to create it? Um, I, I I think I still enjoy helping somebody else's song more than trying to come up with my own. Like right yeah. now, I, yeah. I get like and, a creative fix out of, out of mixing it and coming up with some special effect I- yes. idea or something like that. And uh, yeah, I really like like the. I find like I'm inspired by the idea that I get sent. Yeah, totally. And and just just uh, so that people know, um, you, you said like. You you're um, you sort of falling in love with music again, and I think you mean like with making music, right? I think music in general is something we always loved and and still enjoy and stuff. But but like making your own music is a different thing. Just so people don't misunderstand us here, like we, we're still very passionate, obviously, about music, and it's all we do uh, all the time. But like making your own music is a different story. And I agree. I think the most it's fun to me to be able to work on so many different songs all the time. But it's at the same time, it's very draining also. Like I have to put a lot of creativity and thought and all of that into yeah. all these projects. And that just means that at the end of the day, I don't have much left for my own stuff. And uh, so, but recently that starts to change a little bit. Maybe it's because I do more. No, maybe not. I mean, with coaching, I still work on a lot of <laughs> songs. It's the same thing. Yeah. I don't I don't actually know what it has to do with, but like 
Um, maybe it's just maybe it's just one of those things where you have to do it in order to enjoy it again. So you just have to force yourself for a while, for a while and then it starts get, becoming fun again. I don't know. But at the maybe, moment, yeah. I really enjoy making my own music again. And uh, But it's, it's oh, interesting it's great, how man. that changes. Yeah, Yeah. well, I mean, I've, as you become uh, like a mixing engineer, your your circle of friends starts to become other mixing engineers. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the, the type of people True. that want to talk about the stuff you like talking about, um, right? So, And a lot of those people listen to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts. And it, it's not just because they like to listen to somebody talk. It's because that they're too tired to listen to more music at the end of the day. Um, so that like goes back to, yeah, I totally love it, but I, I didn't have like the space to let more music into my life kind of thing. Like, yes. like listening to music for fun wasn't something I really did a lot of no. for, for years now. But over that last month, being away from music, I was awesome. just like, oh, I want to hear that song. Pull it up. Just listen to it. So... It's a totally different relationship. Um, yeah. And, and it's like, even though I'm less involved with the music in that period, I'm, I'm get, taking more out of it. It's, it's kind of interesting. I don't know. Stuff to think about. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. It actually, we, we made a whole episode on that, like that if you get away from it for a while, you come mm-hmm. back and are more excited about it probably. And it's the same thing, just in the big picture of it, I think. So anyway... Interesting. Back to today's topic. Today is obviously, again, about music and recording, which we love, <laughs> just for the record. Yeah. But like um, today, it's about choosing the right vocal mic for your vo- voice and or room. Like both of those things, those things are important. And um, the, the vocal is, with most genres, the, the most important part, the most important element of your mix of your song. And so it has to, it just has to be right. And we're going to show you what to look for in a vocal mic and how to find the right mic for your room and your voice. And this is important because again, the vocal is typically the most important thing in any in, in a song. And picking the right mic is crucial because if you choose the wrong one, it's very hard, if not impossible, to make it sound great in the mix. Mm-hmm. And we're going to explain the reasons for this and give you examples of the most common problems. So. This is really one of those things where if I get if people send me stuff to mix and I look forward to hearing the song and I um, listen to a couple of things and then I bring in the vocal and I like when it's the wrong mic I immediately know like oh oh man like this is gonna be a long day because it just you know when when it's not right it's very hard to get it right and when it's like when it has one of these common problems that we're gonna talk about this is really challenging to mix. And it's a bummer because we want the vocal to shine and we want to be able to to bring the best out of every song. And and if the vocal is sort of, yeah, challenging to work with, then uh, we, we have a problem and, and we don't want that to happen. So that's why we, we, we do this episode. And I don't know if, if it's the same for you, Malcolm, but I you can fix a lot of things, but the wrong mic in the wrong room for the wrong voice is a, a real problem often. Totally. Yeah, the... The whole reason we're doing this episode is actually because I got sent a song to mix and the vocal uh, was like cool vocal, but the the I could hear like the reflection of the room around it, like and 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 it was kind of noisy. The the noise floor of the mic, it was just like okay, this is a, a great vocal performance that was just captured the wrong way. So a couple quick tweaks and this would be an entirely another level. So whenever this happens, Benny and I are like, well, if we just make a podcast episode about it, that's just going to solve that problem before it even gets sent to us for the next time. So I can just send this episode whenever this happens. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, totally, exactly. (laughs) All right, so let's dive in. I'd say one of the most common things, and I'm always curious to hear your thoughts, maybe your perspective is different, but to me, one of the most common things and most common problems is that the vocal is just too bright, but not in a good way. Mm -hmm. So... Many cheap condenser microphones have these like overly bright, harsh, brittle sounding um, highs, the top end. And uh, it, to me, it's much easier to boost good sounding top end into a darker mic or a darker source than to have to deal with this this harsh, weird sounding, uh, annoying top end. So yes. when in doubt, darker is better to me. And that's one of those things where and it's just sometimes it's just too sibilant and it's the S's and stuff that annoys me but sometimes it's like an overall bright quality to it that I can't really get rid of that is not pleasing agreed agreed The yeah there seems to be a thing among kind of more consumer level uh, condenser mics where they are purposely making them bright to kind of like try and make them sound expensive but it it doesn't really work. And when you plug it in, you're like, oh, that seems shiny. But it's, it's again, without the context of knowing what uh, a great vocal mic sounds like, like, and to compare that, it's kind of hard to know. 
Um, so you can really just pretty much go on the assumption that cheaper condenser mics are going to be kind of artificially brighter. That's what it sounds like, really. It sounds like it's being boosted, um, and it, it's it's kind of weird sounding compared to a really nice microphone that that might be bright. Like I U eighty sevens are are kind of somewhat bright, I think, and but it's a super smooth top end to me comparatively to. Um, like a, a Rode condenser mic. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, Rode is great bang for buck, pretty much across their entire line, I think. But it's like a, it's a different league altogether. And we're talking thousands of dollars, so of course it is. But yeah. there's there's things you can do. Uh, I mean, there, there's going to be other options we're going to talk about in this where you don't have to spend thousands of dollars and you're still going to get a totally professional result. Yes, agreed. I think it's a rule of thumb that cheap condenser mics are something you have to be very careful with, but there are there's always the exception. There are a couple of options that actually don't sound too bad, and it's always it's also it, it got a um, they have to fit your voice. It, it's, it has to match your voice, and for some singers, the the, the problem the quote unquote problem with the brightness is worse than for others. But um, so I'm not saying that none of the affordable mics are are good. But you got to be really careful. And when in doubt, I would go for a darker mic or an entirely different option that we're going to talk about. Uh, one one thing that I always like to mention is because I don't see a lot of people use it for some reason. It, it's a, a very well-selling microphone if I look at the, the online reviews and everything. But I don't see it often in tutorials or when, when producers talk about it or stuff uh, and stuff. But there is a mic by Sennheiser, the MK4, that is pretty affordable. It's below 300 euros. And it's, to me, still, I think, the most pleasing sounding of the cheap condensers. I just love how that mic sounds. It's very, and that's why I wanted to mention it. That's one of those rare mics that really, really sound good that I can really recommend because it's it can take a lot of level. It's pretty flat sounding. It's a pretty flexible mic. It doesn't sound really exciting, but that's the good thing about it. It's pretty flat and high quality mic. And, and that is one of the, yeah, one of those condensers that I can actually recommend, although it's affordable. But that's really an exception. Right. Now, I got to say, I don't understand why nobody associates Sennheiser with high quality gear. I mean, some the film industry does, but I feel like the music yeah. industry doesn't, but all their stuff's great in my opinion. Yeah, like they're they're really incredibly well-built stuff. It, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> check yeah. out check out that stuff. It is is good. Um yeah, uh, Sennheiser and Neumann I think is one company or was or is, I think, but there's like the same you know, it's yeah, same, related it's like, somehow for sure. Yeah, and and it's like a certain there is a certain level of quality that you can expect from their products, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, it, it, it's German made, right, Sennheiser? Yeah, yeah, um, and everything German Germany makes is fantastic, <laughs> including <Yeah>. Benny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> no, um, yeah, but like. Uh, it's, it's the exception, and uh, and and when in doubt, use something else, maybe or check goes for something else. Okay, so another con with condensers, like another thing you have to be careful with, is the problems you're gonna get in an untreated room. So if you're in an untreated or a really bad sounding room, which is to be honest, most rooms, then like mm-hmm. most not uh, non purpose built rooms, basically for recording, um, then you are likely better off avoiding condensers. So it doesn't mean you have to have a fully built out professional studio room, but if you if you haven't at least like a, I don't know, like a well-treated part of the room or corner of the room or something that, that makes, that keeps the early reflections out of the mic and keeps the overall reverb, reverb in the room under control and all of that, unless you have at least that, I think you should be very careful with condensers because they're just so sensitive that even quiet reflections and reverb and all of the other things that are in the room are going to be pretty audible in the mm-hmm. mic because it's just sensitive mics and they pick up the quiet stuff too including all the reflections so in most rooms untreated rooms especially but even like tr- treated but like still bad sounding rooms like jam spaces often are uh, you got to be careful with avoid but with with condensers i think yeah yeah, totally agree. The, the room is going to be something that comes up a lot in this episode. Um, mm-hmm. and, and like you said, one of the, the probably the main takeaway of this episode is most rooms are bad. Yeah. There, it's just a reality is that you probably don't have a room that's going to be as dead as we would recommend. And, you know, you don't have to, your room doesn't have to be like floor to ceiling sound panels to make it a good vocal room, but it does take quite a bit. And the dimensions of the room, what else is in that room play a, a large role as well. If it's like a lot of hard, lot of hard 
like surfaces like desks and stuff like that. And often self-recording vocalists are right in front of a desk, you know, um, because they've got their little recording set up. There's like that stuff kind of does play into it. Um, and it plays into it more with a condenser than a dynamic, which is, yeah, we'll, we'll get it into that though. So yeah. up next, we've got learn about pickup patterns and choose a mic with the right pattern for your situation. So we're talking polar patterns. Um, and the most common and the one we're going to recommend, I would say, is a cardioid. And that, like the polar pattern, I think we've actually talked about this. I don't know if we had an episode about it, but it's definitely come up. But essentially, yeah. it's it's where does your microphone hear from, right? So if you've got an Omni microphone and there's little symbols on your microphone saying what the, the polar pattern is, if it's a cardioid, it hears all around it. So that, I mean, if you're in a, a like going back to a, a bad room with not any sound treatment, that's going to be extra problematic, right? Because it's it's hearing in the fridge behind you or behind the microphone. It's hearing you. It's hearing your laptop fan kick into the right of it. And um, that's all creating this noise floor that when somebody like Benny or I gets it to mix it and we compress it and do whatever we need to do, all of that stuff just gets louder and louder and is just getting in the way of your vocal. So cardioid is, yeah, cardioid is what I would recommend because it, it hears from the front of the microphone, rejects the back. Benny, what do you think? Yes, I agree. Cardioid. Um, there, there are some mics have like super cardioid or hypercardioid, mm-hmm. some of those things that they can work. They are a little narrower. They are, but they also pick up a little more from the back of the mic, less mm-hmm. from the sides, but a little bit from the back, the narrow it gets. But that, could be okay, but I guess with most vocal mics, like most mics that have to have been designed to be vocal mics, they usually are cardioid, or they have like switchable polar patterns where you can yep. go to Omni or a figure of eight, and there's use cases for those. But if you're recording one singer in front of the mic and you want a dry, clean recording that you can that just yeah you can treat well in the mix and it makes it well in the mix, then I think a cardioid is is your go-to in in almost every situation. Totally, yeah. It's going to be great. And the differences between like a hyper and a super cardioid aren't as apparent in that situation with just one vocalist in front of them with proper technique. It's Those are almost more useful in like a live situation, I think, where mm-hmm. like feedback rejection might be the goal. Stuff yes. like that. It still pays. I think it's, it's just important here that, and that's why I included it in the outline, it's just, I think, important to learn about those things so that you are not confused when you read this, when you like checking mics and you read about polar patterns so you know what those are. And then there are situations where a different pattern can be the right choice for you. So I'm Mm. just thinking about like singer-songwriters, for example. If you record a guitar and a vocal at the same time, if that's what you do, an acoustic guitar, then maybe a figure of eight is a good choice for you because it will reject what's below the mic and what's above the guitar so you can have more separation between the guitar and mic. And we're not going to yeah. get into details about polar pattern here, but I, I'm just saying that do your research. It's it's easy to look up and maybe takes a little bit to to really understand, but uh, you can do it. And it's just important to know those things when, when picking the right mic. For most people, if you're just a vocalist standing in front of a mic that's on a stand or even if you have it in your hand, cardioid will be absolutely fine. But there is the exception, uh, and 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 if if that is you, if you are doing something different than than that, then maybe you should uh, do some research and learn about polar patterns. Yeah, and he, okay, here's actually something though. But uh, knowing about polar patterns means that you know that there is a direction that your mic is listening from, and that yeah. is actually something that does occasionally get missed. Uh, people yeah. aren't aware that one side is the back of their microphone and one side is the front, and if you sing into the wrong side, it sounds pretty dreadful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and it's happened. I'm just yes. just saying that could be your problem. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and and it's not always clear like that clearly marked Sennheiser. Another nice thing they do on some of their microphones is literally says front. <laughs> Love yes, that. Ex- exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I still and I've still seen pictures where people put it like the other way around on a guitar amp, you know, right, right. where you can read the you stand in front of the cab and you can read the front, you know. So like that's funny. Uh, but yeah, uh, and and then you know we've all seen the funny I don't know pictures on the internet where people sing into the top of the condenser mic or something yeah. instead of the sides or you know some, that's, something. Yeah, like that's that. actually another super common one. You're right. You're right. Where yeah, the 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 where you address the microphone might not be as clear as you think it is. So yeah. for um, example, if I look at your mic right now, the Rode Dynamic one that you have, that could 
be could be if you don't know like that could be a side address mic you know it, yeah it totally a, it I was going like to say on the sides because it, it almost looks the same as your microphone yeah. in a way it's the same yeah. kind of cylinder um, so knowing that is totally totally vital you, you have to get that right if you don't get yeah. that right it's all all for naught <laughs> yeah totally all right now the next point here is um, that's a little more difficult and if you because it's about being able to to choose the right mic based on the sound you're going for. And this takes some experience. This take this is probably not too easy to do for people starting out. Uh, but what I mean is you have to know your genre, your genre and you the your style of music that you're making. And you gotta think about the sound you're going for. Uh, which means is it do you want a bright vocal sound? Do you want a dark vocal sound? Does it have to be very polished. Does it have to have this expensive like radio sheen, the, the pop vocal sheen sort of thing? Does it have to be really airy with a lot of like the breathy, breathiness, airy sound that you have in, in pop ballads, for example? Does it have to be very gritty with an aggressive mid-range? Will it be distorted anyways? And do you have to you know, like will you do any any sort of crazy effects and and mangle it in in a, in a way? Or does it have to sound modern and bright? Does it have to mm. sound vintage, you know? And, and and again, darker and maybe saturated, all of these things. And um, I mean, maybe you can get a, a basic idea of those. I understand that it's not too easy to know that already or to know what to listen for when you're just starting out. But maybe you can have a, a vague idea of what you're going for. You can listen to some references and then compare different styles of music. And then maybe you find what you want. And then you can do some research on classic mics and popular choices for certain styles. And when you do that, you're going to find what Malcolm said in the beginning that a lot of those classic options are super expensive, that the mics you're going to find when you do research of like popular records and what they've used in those records, a lot of them will be like the standard studio classics, which are pretty expensive. So um, if you can afford those, awesome. And if you know what you're going for, you can afford such a mic, that's always a good thing to have. If not, re I would say resist the temptation to buy a cheap knockoff or any cheap condenser mic in general, as we said, with only a few exceptions. Um, but if you can afford the high-end mics, then then perfect. But it, it's still, I think it pays off to do a little bit of research and at least know about the microphone type. So yeah. is it is that sound coming typically coming from ribbon mics when we talk about vintage things? Is it typically coming from condenser mics because you want that bright, airy, pop vocal sheen? This is typically, you, you can only achieve that with a, with a condenser mic or like maybe you can get close, but that's the typical choice then. Um, is it going to be a tube mic or, you know, it, it just I think it just pays off to to do some research here. And if you find yourself seeing the same models of mics on all the, the records that you like a lot, then you have a direction that you can look into, I think. Yeah. And I do just want to add, like, yeah, if you can afford the high-end mic, perfect, but only if you've dealt with your room. Because like often mm -hmm. these expensive classic mics are condensers. So an expensive mic in a bad room is just gonna hear that bad room and all those issues like reflections and fridges and laptop fans and road noise and stuff more clearly <laughs> it's a yes. now a more detailed problem right um yeah. so in in ways it could be worse so yeah, so right. just keep that in mind now so the, our next point was that for many people using a dynamic vocal mic can be a totally great idea um and i really think that in the case of being a self-recording musician or band this is totally like usually true um, because you probably don't have that treated vocal space and and an environment or or even well yeah it, it's just probably a great idea <laughs> they they generally sound great um and you just talked about benny about how you know like is it going to be distorted um mm -hmm. and like a more like vibey gritty thing like that vocal dynamic vocal mics are often darker and when you think about what's going to happen to them after it's tracked in, like, you know, baking in distortion and tons of compression, it's going to respond to that really well. That's kind of hard to know without the experience of mixing stuff like that. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, actually, you can always bounce that off whoever your mix engineer is and, and just get their thoughts before you record the vocal too. Yes, totally. And and maybe if you like certain bands and the certain, if you're, you're um, yeah, if you like a certain style of music, Maybe then it's it's actually clear that you want some kind of distortion or saturation. Maybe you already know that without knowing how to mix it. But if all the bands you like have distorted vocals, or if that's what you're going for with your own record, then you already know it, right? Totally. So 
and in that case, you don't really, it's going to be lo-fi in a way anyway, so you, you don't necessarily need the extended top end and bottom end of the expensive mics. It's going to be mostly mid-range, and maybe it's it often even sounds better. So case in point, like a lot of high-end recordings have been made in million-dollar studios with all the mic options in, in the world, and they still use an SM7 or some dynamic mic for certain records just because they they sound better for certain things. And mm-hmm. that is oftentimes the gritty mid-range, the distortion, the upfront um, aggressive sound uh, that, that those mics have, the, 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 the sibilance that's more under control and all of these things. So it's not that they are just an option for, for home recording uh, people, but it's like, they are, they've been used on Michael Jackson records and tons totally. of other, yeah, um, tons of other stuff records. Yeah. So, um, okay, dynamic mics. Yeah, that's our recommendation for most people, to be honest. And I'd say, before we explain to you why exactly dynamic mics are are better, we've explained a couple of these things already, but we're going to dive into this a little more. But before we do that, I'd say that you should, if you can, try a couple of options on your own voice in your own environment and then listen on headphones, like in a quiet space, on closed headphones, ideally, so that you can really hear what's going on in the background and what's going on with the room reflections and all those things. because Every voice is different, and same as with like choosing studio speakers, where I also believe that it's important to hear those in your environment before you make a decision. It's the same with mics. I think if you can grab a few different mics, make it do it um, like a, a quick shootout, record a couple of things through those with your voice in your room, and I'm pretty sure you'll find one that you like, and you you have you'll have a couple that you don't like. And I think that's that's always a good idea because how how would you know, right? Like you order one and you probably think it sounds great because like, yeah, it sounds, you know, clean and all that. But you don't really know what the problems are until you compare it to like two or three other mics and right. and hear the difference. Totally, totally. Um, yeah, yeah. We did an episode on guitars just like our last episode or one one or two back. And we, we talked about the importance of shooting out the guitars Mm-hmm. Equally as important, shooting out your vocal options. On the plus, you're probably going to quickly learn like what mic is right for your voice. So it's just kind of something that now you've got your match, you know, and you can keep trying other ones as you go on. And occasionally you might have a song where it just seems like you need to switch it up. But in general, once you kind of find a good match, it's like, all right, this is like kind of a tried and true chain now. This is a part of my sound. And, and that's pretty cool. Just yeah. kind of hang on to that mic. Yeah, and the most important thing to listen for when you do this, when it comes to matching it to your voice, at least to me, is the sibilance. Mm. Every voice has a different, every every person has a different way of pronouncing the S's and the T's and the plosives and all of that, but, but mostly the sibilance. And if you pick the wrong mic that has a high frequency boost exactly where your S's are, basically, and it just doesn't match, then it's very hard to tame that in the mix. Like Great point. all the DSs in the world can't really tame that, or you maybe you can, but then it starts introducing a lisp or something. It's really hard to deal with that sort of stuff. So, really pay attention to the the sibilance, and when in doubt, pick the darker one. But you're gonna find when you compare two or three, you're gonna find that one of or two are gonna sound a little smoother, and then there's gonna be one or two that that sound just harsh and annoying. And maybe maybe throw a compressor on it and see what happens if you really exaggerate that if it gets worse but like that's the first thing i would listen for is the sibilance everything else if there's like a everything every other um problem in the frequency response basically you can sort of correct with eq but it's really hard to do with the sibilance Mm -hmm. yeah i i agree that's that top end can just go really wrong so you just got to watch for it Mm -hmm. um and and You'll at, like for for those interested in being really profession engineers, you'll kind of start to learn what top end works with what microphone. You'll start getting kind of gut instincts on like, oh, that didn't, that's not. I, I hear a problem. This this next mic is going to be the right one, and yeah. um, so that comes with by time. By the way, oh yeah, yeah. So sorry, yeah. But but by the way, one really great great way of learning that. And also a good mic option, actually, if you can afford it. It's not super crazy expensive, but I, at least I think so, um, is the the Slate ML1 mm-hmm. modeling mic. I have one of those, and I really, really like it. It's Does it sound the same like the expensive, real classic mics? Probably not, but I don't really care. I had a Neumann. I had a U87. I had borrowed a U67 at, one, some, at, at some point, which was my favorite mic. Um, I had a, I've heard couple of U40, U47s, which is also classic. And honestly, I sold my 87 and I've never borrowed another um, expensive mic since I got the Slate one because it just sounds great. And I don't care if it sounds exactly the same, but it's great. And the cool thing about it is you have all these mic models 
in the software and you can do a shootout really quickly and you can learn what the different models sound like, like the broad characteristics. And um, to me, that is a f- honestly really, uh, and we're not sponsored by Slate or anything, but like to me, that's really a mic locker uh, full of great mics that you can just cycle through. And and that flexibility and the, the overall like sound quality of that mic is just very cool to me. Yeah, totally. I have to be honest, I had to send it back once. So I'm... They have, I don't know, maybe they fixed it now, but they had some quality control issues with the mic. But if you have, if you got a working one, it's really, really great. And I've had to send it back once, and now I have it for like four or five years and without a single problem. So yeah, yeah, I, I've got the same microphone. It's the the only large diaphragm condenser I own right now because it, yeah, it just checks those boxes for me, no, no problem. Um, so yeah. it, it pretty great bang for the buck, honestly. Um, yeah. Okay. But now into the the whole dynamic mic conversation. By the way, one one final thing because I have to say it's so people will will ask me like what do we have to listen for and how do I know and all these things. You can book a call with me and ask me these questions directly. You can go to the selfrecordingband.com slash call, and you can send me a, a clip of you singing into a couple of mics or into your mic that you have, and I can tell you exactly what to listen for. I can tell you if that's going to be a problem or not. We can talk about your your style and what you're going for and whether or not that mic will work with that. So if you go to the selfrecordingband.com slash call and book a free call, I'm happy to help you with this. And uh, I'm, yeah, just just do it. Basically, I'm offering still offering these free calls. And if you're interested in leveling up your production skills and uh, we want to start with with me helping you with the vocal mic, sure, do it. Yeah, that, that's a great option. Because it, it is hard to know what a problem is people when i when i discover like a, a vocal track then i'm like okay we we need to do something about this so it's better next time they generally don't know they, they weren't aware that there was an issue um so unless you're listening for it you might not pick up on it so i i think just like quick things to to try and tune your ear in on would mm-hmm. be yeah the, like echoes like kind of quick reflections off other surfaces in the room those are only going to get louder as you mix a vocal, um, much louder, in fact. So, so those quickly become problematic, and they almost create like if it's bad, it can create like a, a reverb almost because that that echo gets so loud that it sounds like it's a, a, a delay or a reverb on the vocal as it's been compressed, and then you know the mix note comes in. Can we not have reverb? It's, well, no, you can't because it's it's in there. <laughs> yeah. um, it's natural reverb at this point. Um, and then, uh, like other, yeah, appliances, you know, I used to have a one room tiny home and my fridge would click on and be like, all right, we got to stop recording for a bit, <laughs> wait for the fridge to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, and you know, that's not ideal, but the, you know, at the end of the day, the best mic and best room for the job is what you have. Um, so you, you kind of have to make it work if that's what you got kind of thing. Um, if you only have one and you only have one room to do it and you got to use that, but it, if you can avoid these things or at least start planning to to correct them or or maybe there's some easy fixes like building some easy sound panels, that kind of stuff, it's totally worth doing. But I don't want people to just stop recording because they think that there's like a little bit of an echo in their room. Like it, it, you got you to gotta just work with what you have at the end of the day. Absolutely, absolutely. There's always a way to make it work. But mic positioning and treatment of the room and all of that is a whole different conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, if, if we have podcast episodes on that, I'm going to just put it in the show notes. I can't remember from the top of my head. We, we definitely have something about that. I'm going to put related episodes in the show notes. So if you go to the selfrecordingband.com and then slash the number of this episode, I'm not sure yet which one it's going to be, but like the selfrecordingband.com slash 125 or whatever the, the number is, go there and... Uh, you're going to find the show notes and related episodes are going to be in there. Uh, this one is about mic selection, but you're totally right, Malcolm. You can definitely make almost any room work. Our opinion is that a dynamic mic is, is good in a lot of cases, but that, whatever you have or whatever you end up buying, don't let all of that hold you back uh, from, from recording in your room. There's always a way. Mm-hmm. Agreed, agreed. So value for money, good dynamic mics. Be the Shure SM7B is the one that you've probably all heard us mention or heard somebody mention. Probably the most famous large diaphragm dynamic mic, and it, it's just great. It, like there's really that's that's money well spent. They're they're pretty darn affordable, I think, and they're pretty great. Another one would be the Rode Procaster, which I'm using right now. That's what you're hearing me talking to. 
yeah, both both good options. Now, there's a thing called like a cloud lifter, uh, and and other companies make similar things. And these are just like little inline game boosters because these mics are generally pretty quiet, so you have to turn up your preamp a lot. If you're finding that a problem on whatever interface you have, you might have to get one of these things. But they're they're like anywhere from like thirty to a couple hundred bucks, pretty much, right? Um, yeah. And, and so you don't have to spend a lot of money to get that solved. But just know that that could be a thing. That's like the one catch with some large diaphragm condensers. Yeah. Aston Stealth is an incredible mic. Super yep. versatile. Uh, has the kind of cloud lifter thing built into it, I'm pretty sure. It's a little active circuit. Um, and uh, Electro Voice RE20 is probably the coolest looking of all of them. <laughs> yeah. I think they're super rad. And yeah, great mic actually for, for drums and stuff too. Um, and it doesn't have the proximity effect. That's a very rare case of a mic without that. Like it's a mm. it's a cardioid mic and it's dynamic, which typically means proximity effect. But you can get really close to an RE twenty without. Maybe there's a little bit of, but like not really. So um, it's pretty flat, even if you are really close to it. That's cool. a special thing about that mic. All right, I didn't know that. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, and you know what? Like as we, we were, I want to say that this is a better investment than a large diaphragm condenser, probably. Because it's probably more versatile. It's probably a mic you're going to use on a lot of stuff. Like the RE20 is a great guitar cab microphone. It's great yes. on bass cabs, actually, too. It's fantastic on kick drums. Um, yeah. I'm sure you could use it on a snare, no problem. Uh, SM7B is the most popular hi hat mic I've ever heard of. Um, people use it on other parts of the drum kit all the time. It's just a good sounding mic, it's going to do a good job. On most things, really. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, especially loud things. It's great on loud things. Um, so, and you asked in stealth. I've used that on guitars. It was great. I uh, used it on percussion. It was great. Um, yeah, they, these are these are really versatile mics. And it, while they're fantastic for vocals, they're also fantastic for other things. So, if you look at it that way, it's an even better bang for buck. Yes, totally. So, yeah, there's three reasons for basically for why we why we recommend those. The first one is the value for money. Um, the, the, the dynamic mics typically sound better than the uh, condenser ones in the same price range. Uh, so if you go con condenser, you have to invest a little more. The second reason is what we've said about the rooms. Uh, most rooms are problematic, so uh, a dynamic will handle that better. And it's not just the room reflections. It's like you said, knock them, appliances, like, um, you know, street noise, what road noise, whatever, laptop fans, that sort of stuff. It's just less sensitive than condensers. So... That also means you have to be you have to get really close to the dynamic mic. Uh, you immediately notice that if you've ever recorded or if you've ever played live with an SM58, and you then you know what happens if you step back. Yeah, like a few inches from the SM58, basically nothing. Like the voice goes away. Basically, you have to be really close, and and that's the good thing about them because that means everything that's far away, noise, reflections, all of that is going to be quiet. So there's that, and then the third reason is as we said the 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 character of it the sound character the the gritty sort of mid range um that's probably as we said a little difficult to hear for for some of you but i i really think that there's a yeah there's of course there's a different character to those mics because they work entirely differently and and condensers often have often are a little too detailed for some things you know that's also the reason why we like dynamic mics on guitar cabs and you can use guitar condensers on guitar caps, but the more common choice are dynamic mics because a condenser is just too detailed and has too much top end. And we want to have the the, the mid-range and we don't want all the details all the time. And so mm -hmm. for some vocals, for screams, for more aggressive vocals, but like basically for, yeah, for any modern vocal that just has to cut through the mid-range of such of a dynamic mic, of a good dynamic mic will just work, but without the annoying sibilance. And you can still boost a lot of top end into those mics so you can make a dynamic mic sound more expensive and brighter will it have the same like pop sheen like as a condenser probably not but you can still make it bright and i think making such a mic brighter will always sound better than trying to make a cheap condenser sound darker and if it's like if it worked for michael jackson you know yeah then <laughs> probably good enough so at the end of the day i think You'll have to try and figure out what works best with your voice and your style of music and your room. Uh, but just don't think you have to use a condenser just because that's what you see in most pictures of recording studios, right? So if I look at like one, maybe, maybe that proves my point. If I look at the Toman, Toman is like the biggest um, European music, um, you know, store, online yeah, like store, the, reseller. The sort of. equivalent of Sweetwater over in North America, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And if I look at their top sellers, not in the recording category, but overall, like of all the items that they sell, 
Number one is the SM58. Number two is a Focusrite Scarlet. Number three is some mic stand. And then number four is the SM7. Right. So it's so popular for a reason. And they have all guitars in the world and all the drums and basses and all the other stuff. But the SM7 is the number four most sold piece of gear that they have in the entire store. Wow. So, yeah. And for a good reason. Yeah. And, you know, probably the most common podcasting mic out there as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Very versatile. Yeah, totally, totally. So yeah, and if you if you still like if you're still skeptical, just Google. I don't know records made with an SM7, and you probably find a couple of really great records, and that w- might make you feel more comfortable about using a dynamic mic once you see that. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, take Benny up on on that coaching call if you're unsure if if your vocals are making the cut. He can have a listen and, and tell you. Um, and and you know. Uh, I, I encourage everyone to treat their vocal space however they can. You know, we, we've got a whole episode on acoustic treatment with Yesco Lohan, and it's like one of my favorite episodes ever. And I think it's one of the most valuable lessons as for what people need to know about their recording space. And it's really affordable to to treat, uh, to do enough treatment for a vocal setup. Um, and But if you can't do that, you know, mattresses, blankets, everything you can pile in there is going to be helpful probably. Uh, but it just has to be done. So do whatever yeah. it takes. Yeah, agreed. All right, perfect. So that's it for the day. I think yeah. um, that covers it. Go to the show notes page for related episodes on the acoustic stuff and all of that. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you Looking for listening. Looking forward to it. Take care. Bye. Take care. <laughs>